It's my pleasure to welcome Dr. Tanya Bubla to the podium. Uh, Dr. Bubla is an associate professor in the School of Public Health right here at the University of Alberta. Uh, she has a background in health law and medical research policy and uh, uh, molecular genetics as well. Uh, she's part of the team that is uh, going to be conducting choroideremia gene therapy uh, here at the University of Alberta. Uh, this, as you've already heard, I think, is a, a, a joint project funded by the Foundation Fighting Blindness and the Canadian Institutes of Health Research. Uh, and today she uh, is going to tell us about clinical trials and what we should continue, uh, what, what you should consider if the opportunity arises for you uh, or your loved ones who uh, have inherited retinal disease to participate in a clinical trial. Uh, I'll be available after her talk uh, along with her uh, to answer your questions. So without uh, further ado, uh, I please join me in welcoming Dr. Tanya Bubla. Well, thank you very much for the invitation. This is uh, a real privilege to be here today. I'd like to uh, thank FFB and the organizing committee for having me speak today. Um, these are really exciting times in, in eye research. And I know that it's been an exciting time for a long time, but what's coming down the pipeline right now really is quite thrilling. Um, I, I do quite a bit of work with different patient organizations. Um, the last time I've addressed a, a, a group such as yourselves was with the Parkinson's Association. And the reason for that is that I, I'm a lawyer. Um, my background and my, my PhD is in, in biology. And so I work around uh, regulatory policy, particularly in the areas of sort of novel um, therapeutics and biotechnology as they come down the pipeline. So I'm a principal investigator with the stem cell network. So I, I sort of have one foot in the, in the stem cell research camp. And my connection here with the uh, choroideremia gene therapy trial was actually completely facilitated by this wonderful young woman right here, Shelley Benjamini, who is my master's student. Um, she is uh, a joint student with, uh, with Dr. McDonald, so she actually introduced us and, and got me involved in, in, in this whole area. And uh, Shelley has been working uh, with, uh, with patients and with clinicians to look at expectations and communications around clinical trials. So we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that. So what I was hoping to do, first of all, was to put clinical trials into a little bit of, of context, a little bit about what kinds of clinical trials are, are coming up or are actively recruiting uh, for participants right now. I want to talk a little bit about the regulatory process because when I talk to other patient groups, the big question that I'm always asked is why do therapies take so long? You know, we hear this incredibly neat stuff, and we read it in the newspapers, we see it on the internet, um, and it sounds like it should be just around the corner. It sh sounds as though those therapies should be in our hands, you know, in our, in our lifetimes or in, within the, the period that we could benefit. And yet things just seem to drag on forever and ever and ever. So I'd like to address that issue of timelines a little bit. And part of it, um, Dr. McDonald alluded to in the earlier, his session just before this, some of it has to do with the issue of the regulatory environment and how things actually go or move from what we would call the bench, so the laboratory bench where people are working in those petri dishes and test tubes and, and then into small animal models in, 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 in mice and in zebra fish we were hearing about last night. Um, but you know, people aren't rodents. You know, they're not fish either, right? So things that work in really small animals often just don't pan out when you try to, to move them into larger animals or into, into humans. And then even when things move into humans, there's a whole series of different kinds of clinical trials that, that go through before a regulator is going to rubber stamp that and say, you know, we're putting, we're going to put our approval on this and we're going to allow this therapy to be marketed to, to enter into public consumption in, in, in the healthcare system. And then after that, 
there's still another step because just because you've got regulatory approval and the regulator says this is safe and better than the treatment that we had before or it's a new treatment if there wasn't one before, you still have to battle what we would call the reimbursement system, right? You have to battle the payers. So in the, in the United States, that would be the, the private insurance companies. And in Canada, that would be the, the provincial health systems, where they have to then say, assess it themselves and say, we're going to actually cover this and make it part of the package or the bundle of, of, of therapies that we offer. So, you know, all of those things add a time step. So I'm going to give you the example of the, the LCA trial. Incredible piece of research, you know, really, really, really neat stuff. But when you think about that timeline, you're starting from you know, 1869, when the condition was first described by Dr. Labor, right? 1869. And then you move that forward to 1997, before the gene was identified, OK? Then from 1997 through now we're, we're, you know, it's less than 100 years. We're moving to four years. Well, let's try, now that we've identified the gene, and this is one of those terrific you know, conditions that is a hope for gene therapy because it, we can identify one gene associated with it. So we can try a gene therapy. We can try to replace that gene, or we can try to insert a working copy of that gene so that the, the, the cells work properly in the retina. Um, and you know, that happened in a dog in 2001, so that's only four years, okay? But 2001, we still don't have LCA gene therapy being available in the health system. Well, that's because you didn't get an inhuman trial started until 2007, and that's a phase one trial. And now the phase three trial, the kind of the last step in the clinical trial process, they're just, it's not even quite open for recruitment yet, right? So these things take time. And part of the reason that these things take time is that um, you know, regulatory systems were set up to regulate small molecule drugs. They were set up to regulate little tiny things that we could measure what happens to them when we put them into a human. We can measure the dose that we need to give to people. We can measure how long that drug stays in the body. And we can measure how long it takes before it leaves the system. And we can measure the effects of it. So that's what regulatory processes were really designed to do. But once we start talking about gene therapy, and when we start talking about you know, stem cell therapy, which is a cell therapy, or even if when we start talking about what we call biologics, which are um, like protein replacement treatments, things like insulin, right? When we start talking about these large proteins, or cells, or genes, we're talking about things that are much less predictable when we put them into a human body. And so the regulatory agencies have really had to adapt, and they're still working on it, especially with cell therapies. It's a very, very difficult thing for them to do. Because when you think about it, what you want from this treatment is not like a drug. It's not like something that you're going to take. You're going to, you're, you're going to ingest it like a, an aspirin. You're going to take it. Your headache's going to get a little bit better. And by the next day, if anyone took a blood test, they wouldn't know that you had ever taken that aspirin, right? What you're talking about with gene therapy and with cell therapy is are processes that you actually want to stick around in the human body for a really long time and to function pretty much for the lifetime of that person, right? It's almost more like an organ transplant, right? So with with stem cell therapies, you know, they have been around for, for quite a while. They've been around for um, well, since the 1950s. Does anyone know what the first stem cell therapy has been that's been around since the 1950s? It'd be called a bone marrow transplantation. Yeah? So really, we, we've called it a bone marrow transplantation for all that time because we didn't understand the biology. We knew that it worked. We knew that if we had a, a, a person with leukemia, if we could um, basically kill off their, their, their blood system, right, their immune system, and um, the blood system is regenerated from cells 
in the bone marrow. But we really didn't understand the underlying biology, the mechanism for that, how it worked. And then finally, we worked out that what we were really doing and what we've been doing for 60 years is a stem cell therapy. So once we can identify the cells that actually regenerate a whole organ system, the blood, right? and the immune system that goes along with it, once we understand that better, then we can work out better ways to extract st the stem cells, the cells that are actually going to work. We can work out better ways um, to, you know, to ensure that it's safe and, and efficacious. And then we can think about other really cool things that we could potentially do with these cells. Right? So stem cell therapy has really expanded um, if you're looking now as, as it moves into the clinic, it's really only been around in the last decade. And so I, I, I just, you know, out of curiosity, looked up some of the, some of the, some of the trials that are going on right now. Um, if you look at all of the clinical trials right now for retinitis pigment, um, pigmentosa, there are 78 um, and 29 that are open and recruiting. And three of those are stem cell therapy trials, but they're not yet occurring here, right? They're occurring in Brazil and in, in Thailand. So they may be a little bit iffy. I would be a little bit skeptical about, about, those, um, about those trials. But when you look at um, some of the macular degenerations, so let's stargates, for example, you have some really interesting trials that are very early stage that are using human embryonic derived, um, retinal cells derived from human embryonic stem cells. And uh, they've just finished their 10th patient. So it's too early to see whether these things are going to work, but they are beginning to, to enter into very, very early stage uh, clinical trials. The big, the really fast moving area for stem cell, um, for stem cell therapies and is in corneal uh, regeneration. So it has already pretty much entered uh, clinical care in, in Europe for um, cornea that are um, that are damaged due to burns or chemical burns. So they can regenerate the cornea, which is a very, very simple layer of cells relative to the retina, right? They can regenerate those if there's enough undamaged tissue where they can extract the patient's own stem cells to regrow the, the cornea. So there's proof of principle, is what I'm saying. You know, There's, there's proof that this stuff has potential. But it's almost like we're in forwards, backwards land. We're in Alice in Wonderland land. The faster we run, the, less, the more we work out how little we know. So sometimes you run really fast, or you have to, and sometimes you have to go backwards to go forwards. So it's one of those things where as you start to work with more and more complex systems, and you try to turn those into therapies, um, things just get really complicated scientifically, all right? So the scientists are working really hard. These things are really exciting. They have a lot of potential. But that level of complexity makes regulators nervous. That's what, um, basically the bottom line. And really, with gene therapy, um, they have reason to be nervous, all right? This is a field that has a little bit, and I would say the what's going on in the eye is a real exception to this, okay? The eye as an organ is special. There are things that you can do in the eye that you can't do in other parts of the body or in other organs in the body. But way back when, so we're talking back in the 1990s now, okay, maybe not so far, but you know, when was, where was I in the 1990s? I was in graduate school in the 1990s, so it seems a long time ago. So back in the 1990s, there was a lot of excitement about gene therapy. You know, it was, this, it was basically at the, at the front end of the genomics revolution. And so there was, I would say, probably at the time, a premature move from the bench into patients. All of that excitement and all of that hype it got a little carried away. And there were some real consequences. So they tried to treat, they treated metabolic diseases, and they, um, and they treated um, sort of immune deficiency diseases. So instead of 
targeting a nice contained organ like the eye, they went for therapies for the entire body system, all right? And guess what happened? It was not good. There was one 16-year-old boy that died in, 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 in Pennsylvania, and there were some kids that with an immune, immune therapy diseases or immune diseases that they tried to treat that de developed leukemias, okay? So the FDA basically shut down gene therapy. There was a moratorium on gene therapy um, that was, I've got my dates here, I need to, Shelley can tell me off the top of her head, but this was uh, in, the early, um, in the early 2000s, so a decade ago. Um, and it's just coming back. And the thing that has pushed it back into the forefront and has brought all of this excitement back into the field is the successful LCA trial that's now moving into phase three. And not only was that early stages trials proven or shown to be safe, was shown to be efficacious, and it was shown to be so safe that the current trial that's now recruiting for phase three in LCA is in children. Do you know how safe it has to be for the FDA to give approval for a clinical trial in children? So, you know, really, this is a field that has turned around, and it's turned around because of what is going on in advances in therapies in, and, and studies in the eye, all right? So what's the process? How do we, how do we get from there to here? Well, we start in, there's a whole lot of safety data that needs to be collected um, from those laboratory studies. So the things that they're interested in in those small animal studies, so in things like um, you know, mice and zebrafish, and the, the FDA really likes mice because all of their data comes in from mice. There's really neat things that you can do with mice. We, we, we have these things called knockout and knock-in mice, so you can, um, you can knock out whole genes in mice and see what function, what happens, and then you can try to put them back in and see what happens. So they're, they're quite manipulable, and we can, we can do cool things in mice. You can do the kinds of experiments that you can, you can imagine in your dreams in mice that you, there's no way you'd ever be allowed to do it in a human, like none. But, you know, mice, it's okay, I guess. But anyway, the FDA likes data from mice. But what they've shown with the, with the data from mice is that what goes into the eye stays in the eye, right? So you do gene therapy in the retinal tissue of a mouse you can't detect it in any of the other tissues, right? So it's that kind of data that the FDA or in, in Canada, Health Canada, needs in order to um, s approve a proof in principle and that this is going to be safe enough to at least try in humans, okay? Now, you can't just stop. The FDA will never approve a trial just based on mouse data or test tube data. Generally, the next step, and it's a very expensive step and very difficult, is in large animal models. So the LCA trial was done in specially bred laboratory dogs, so they're kind of like a beagle. I, I don't know if you've seen the video. They're, they're actually kind of they're kind of cute. <laughs> but they, they do it in dogs. In stem cell research, the, animal, the large animal model of choice is the pig, because pigs are um, actually pretty similar to humans, right? Like getting a lot more similar in, in terms, especially in terms of organ size and, and a lot of the different kind of you know, immune settings. It's, the pigs are pretty good. So then you need to show safety profiles in large animals. So once you've collected all of this sort of safety data that isn't in humans, um, it's time to start thinking potentially about moving into a first in human trial. Now, um, Dr. McDonald was talking a little bit in the, last, in the last session about what this process looks like. The first step, and they're kind of a little bit in parallel, but you, you do need to have institutional approval first. So, you know, the, the trial gets funded, or you eke together enough money to, to get the trial running. It's different if it's a pharmaceutical, because then generally you have a large corporation backing you in rare diseases and something that's um, you know, as revolutionary and as experimental as gene therapy, 
these trials, same with the stem cell trials. These are all done in academic centers, and they're all done pretty much with public money and with foundation money. So these trials do not go forward because there's no commercial interest. They don't go forward without taxpayer dollars and philanthropic funds, so money from charities and from foundations. They just won't happen. So the trial gets, then you have to put together a package, and it goes to what's called the Research Ethics Board, um, or an Institutional Review Board, an IRB is what they're called in the States. We call them REBs, Research Ethics Boards. So here, uh, you know, the trial that's uh, get, taking place here basically has to go through multi-layers of, of ethics review. Um, both, it has to be approved at the hospital level and at the University of Alberta um, Ethics Board. And what they really want to see is um, they want to see the risk-benefit profile, right? So what are the risks versus the benefits? And then they want to see what's called the consent form. And from a lawyer perspective, this is really the heart of the trial. So the reason why consent is so important is I'm going to go give a little bit of a back back backwards tour in, in history as well, is that in the past, there have been some really horrible things done to patients in the name of medical science. So just three things that would come to mind. The, the first sort of international agreement um, around uh, informed consent and around research ethics came in at, it's called a, it's a Nuremberg Agreement that came as a result of the atrocities that were perpetrated during the Second World War in the name of medical experimentation by the Nazis. The next things um, were the thalidomide. Um, the, th the horrible, the horrible things that happened with thalidomide that were, you know, the risks. Some of those risks were known, and yet they continued to put things into 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 patients, right? Then the the other horrible thing was in the 1970s. Um, I don't know if you heard the, about the Takagi um, trials or the research, where there were groups of uh, lower income African American men from the 1930s that were allowed to. Um, were not treated for syphilis, just to see what happened. All right. So these are these are these are anomalies. You know, 99.9 percent .9 of research proceeds very well, but there are real reasons for a regulatory system and real reasons for ethical oversight of clinical trials. Researchers, we want them to be enthusiastic about what they do. We want them to believe in what they do. We want them to advance science and advance medicine. But sometimes you need to have that objective view. Well, always. You need to have that, let's take a step back and look at the evidence objectively and make sure that we are not putting people's lives at unnecessary risk. So this is this whole principle of what we call informed consent. And the Supreme Court of Canada has ruled on informed consent and patients' rights. And what we mean by informed consent is that the patients need to be given the opportunity and have explained to them everything that a reasonable patient would want to know given their personal circumstances. That's the way it's defined by the Supreme Court of Canada. And that definition is really important, putting it back on the patient, what the reasonable patient would want to know is because you, the other flip side, the other definition that you could have is what the doctor, reasonable doctor would feel like telling, okay? But that is not our definition of informed consent. Our definition of informed consent is what the reasonable patient would want to know. So that means there's an absolute obligation on physicians, on clinicians, and especially on researchers. This, this obligation is heightened in the context of experimental treatments, in the context of clinical trials. There's an absolute obligation that all of the risks, all of the risks have to be disclosed. So the patient has to be told in real terms what the objectives of the trial are and then have the opportunity to understand 
both the severity and the likelihood or probability of the risks. All right? So that's the research ethics process. Once we get through the research ethics process, we then move into clinical trials. So the choroideremia trial will be a phase one clinical trial. And a phase one clinical trial, the primary purpose of phase one is to study the amount that can safely be given, and it's a safety trial. It's absolutely purely focused on safety, and then on developing the measures for safety and potentially for e efficacy later on down the line. But it is a safety profile trial. Very few people in enrolled, so sometimes under 20, in this case in, uh, 12 patients. So this is early stage, okay? It's not until phase two that you start to move into really getting at the nuts and bolts of efficacy. And then phase three is the sort of the gold standard. It's the, it's the, um, the randomized controlled trial where patients are, have a 50-50 chance of being given a um, placebo, right? So a, so a fake treatment or being given the actual active, uh, active treatment. And after that, it's only after all of those three phases of the trial are completed that Health Canada will approve, basically it will be issued with what's called a notice of compliance that will enable that therapy to be used in health systems, right, to be put into patients. So in terms of this trial, what, um, it's a phase one trial. It's primarily focused on safety. The, um, there are a lot of, there's a lot of testing that will go hand in hand with that. Um, and some of those measures in terms of what is actually happening to the, to the retina or changes in the retina will bleed into what we would think of as measures of efficacy. But the primary purpose is safety, okay? In terms of how, what happens when you, when you come up, there's always inclusion exclusion criteria. These should be clearly stated. Um, there'll be a, a pool of patients um, who could potentially meet those inclusion exclusion criteria. The patients that are actually selected will be done uh, in, a, in a consultation through, a, through an advisory board. Um, but they have to meet the inclusion exclusion criteria when they are finalized and set. Um, and then there will be burdens placed on those individuals. They have to, will have to meet a general sort of a health test. And then there'll be some level of commitment in terms of follow up. But the really important thing to, to note when you are, if you ever enroll in a clinical trial, is that you can withdraw your consent at any time. If after a month or two, right, things aren't working out, you, you have the right to withdraw consent. Now, it's not great for the researchers, and that's, but that's the way it is. You have an absolute right to withdraw your consent. Um, but, you know, don't underestimate the psychological and the economic and the financial burdens and the time um, that you will be asked to generously give up in order to advance research in a, in a clinical trial. Um, and just one final point is don't forget to make sure that all of your questions are answered. Every single question you have, those researchers have an obligation to give you an answer to your questions. Thank you very much, Dr. Bubla. Uh, so we have just barely 10 minutes for questions. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Buble, for the information you've given us. I have a question, and perhaps um, I'm not sure if this has been tested yet, but for instance, in the LCA trial, if you were involved in phase one, is it possible to be then involved in phase two? Have there been any results? Normally, um, an exclusion criteria would be um, prior um, treatment. So generally, I, Dr. McDonald might be able to answer this better, but I would say generally 
your the phase three um, patients would not have been involved in in earlier in earlier phase trials. And is there a reason for it? Or um, yeah, because you because they've already been they've already had gene therapy. Right, mm -hmm. so you you need to you need to test things in an, in a in a novel patient population, right? Because mm -hmm. the prior results or the prior treatment could impact on the results that you get from secondary application, right? I see, and I think that's what I'm getting to is then even if they weren't in phase three, would an increase of the gene or can there be an increase? in the gene therapy? So the, the phase one trial is, is generally where what we would call the dose escalation studies happen. Right. Mm -hmm. So basically, the, the unusual thing about these kinds of trials is that they're conducted in patients. Mm -hmm. So we, technically, we call them a phase 1b trial, which is probably mm -hmm. too much information. But um, normally, phase one trials for pharmaceuticals occur in healthy volunteers. And it's not until you hit phase two that you actually um, put the, start the trial in patients. Mm -hmm. But where the risks are too high that it's unethical to attempt the treatment in a healthy volunteer, mm. they go straight to the phase one being in patients. So um, in a case like um, for the joint, all of the gene therapy trials, all of the stem cell trials, mm -hmm. they're all done in patients. It's a, the same would be. It's not uncommon, right? Mm -hmm. The same would be for oncology drugs, mm -hmm. because they're pretty. You know, I mean, it's not something you necessarily want to put into healthy volunteers, right? So, um, so these are done in patients first, right? Right. But if you've had gene therapy already. Then you're not sort of a sort of a clean, neat new patient for because remember the whole purpose of the trials is to collect the data mm -hmm. um, in order to get the regulatory approval to put it out there into the into the marketing now right. now to mark, marketing approval to actually put it out into the into the population. Okay. Um, so. Um, so what would happen generally is you would start at a lower dose, do a few patients, then move to a mid dose, and then move to uh, move to a higher dose. And once that, that that's all in the phase one, where you establish the dose threshold of, of the optimal, you know, the dose that you want to use, mm -hmm. and then it goes into a, a phase two. Sometimes, as in with the LCA trial, there was no phase two trial; it was a combined phase one, phase two. Mm -hmm. Um, and that requires a little bit of additional regulatory approval. You can do the both the sort of the safety profile, dose escalation, and efficacy at the same time, but you need to have. Um, it's a bit more complicated to get the approval mm -hmm. because you need to have a statistician involved. Mm -hmm. Because the smaller the effect you're trying to measure, mm -hmm. the larger the number of patients you have to try it in. So you need to have a statistician involved to tell you what the right number of patients are to be able to get any valid measures of efficacy. I okay? See. So that's why phase two trials are a little bit more complicated. But with the LCA trial, they combine the phase one, phase two trial together, and that's why they're now into phase three. Okay? And right, and that makes total sense. Thank you very much. Yeah. Okay. Great. Do you all know where to go to try to find clinical trials? Yeah, you know, because there's a there's a bunch of different registries. So I know FFB um, is very proactive in in helping to match patients with ongoing clinical trials. But there's a terrific website that has actually improved quite a bit. It it's actually the site that's used for researchers and by the regulators. But they have very good patient information on it as well. It's called Clinical Trials. Gov, which is the U.S. site. And the other organization, um, because a lot of these trials, especially for stem cell research and gene therapy, are actually occurring in the United States. The bulk of gene therapy trials are occurring in the U.S. Um, the Mayo Clinic also has a, uh, a matching site for patients that are interested in, um, in registering or being involved with, uh, with clinical trials. And you know, just to remember that 
uh, most of the clinical trials are everything from you know acupuncture and nutrition through um, preventative measures through um, drugs, eye drops. Um, not everything is this really kind of advanced stuff like uh, gene therapies and stem cell therapies. So, you know, it's worth keeping an eye on the research that that is ongoing, and there's some very good resources online um, that are available. Thank you very much. Um, uh, I want to thank you again, Dr. Bula, for uh, giving us the benefit of your knowledge and expertise and insight.